on a hot summer day, I have the privilege of sipping a cool drink in front of the patio of the former home of one of our national heroes. It's a special Tuesday edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Audrey. So, which national hero is it? I know you don't know and I will give you a hint. I'm in the community of Cherry Gardens in the parish of St. Andrew. Now I know the history buffs have it. For the rest of you who do not, you'll have to keep watching to find out more hints and of course, the answers. Stay tuned. So everybody make it sign the line celebration again independence time. For Independence 2015, the Randy Williams Entertainment Center is the place to be. From August 1 to 6, the Hope Road location will be transformed into an independence village. Come out every day at midday for lots of cultural fun and excitement. Lunch or concerts, cultural discussions, a kiddies village, displays with distinct Jamaican pieces, nightly entertainment and food can done. For more information call JCDC at 926-572629 or email library at jcdc.gov.jm. Independence 2015, proud and free Jamaica 53. Good day, I'm Stacey Ann Smith and this is your GIS News for Tuesday, July 28. In four months' time, residents of Woodhall and its environs should have an alternate route to get to their homes. On Monday, Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller signed a $15.2 million contract to build a box culvert for the West Central St. Catherine community. This bridge is now to be reconstructed, will include demolition of the existing structure, earthworks, placing of reinforcing bars, formwork and concrete to box culvert, river protection works, limited base construction, and double excavation. With the road closed for over 20 years, the Browns Hall main road was the only point of entry and exit into Woodhall and adjoining communities. Alcar Construction and Haulage Limited will begin reconstruction works on Monday, August 3. Prime Minister Simpson Miller used the contract signing to reiterate her government's commitment to providing adequate social and economic development for rural communities in the island. There's no doubt that having no access to quality roads and bridges negatively affect people's welfare and daily life. It is therefore of critical importance that we pay special attention to roadways and bridges in these communities to encourage their economic development. Housing Minister Dr. Morris Guy is calling for more private sector entities to partner with government to deliver more affordable housing solutions for Jamaicans. This is what this country needs right now. This is what it needs as the shot in the arm to help with developmental process to grow the economy. He says the housing deficit of 400,000 needs to be reduced significantly by pooling resources and completing more houses each year, particularly for persons in the lower to middle income groups. We in the ministry have developed public-private partnership policy, not only for other areas of divestment, but also in housing construction. We want to utilize that. We have the, the Housing Act, where we have facilitation agreements with private sector, we want to utilize that as well. Dr. Guy was speaking during a tour of Seville Meadows Phase 3, where 500 one- and two-bedroom units are at various stages of construction. The scheme is being built through a public-private partnership. Dr. Guy also toured Seville Meadows Phase 2, where 155 units have been completed. The long-awaited Jamaica Teaching Council JTC bill is now ready to be submitted to Parliament's Legislative Committee when the legislature resumes sittings later this year. Education Minister Reverend Ronald Thwaites made the disclosure while speaking at the recent Jamaica Teaching Council Master Teachers Program Exhibition and Award Ceremony. I am pleased to say that we have reached a point now where the many modifications to an original draft that preceded my tenure as Minister of Education can now be submitted to the Legislative Committee of Parliament in order to be, able to be eventually placed before the, the full House. 
The Jamaica Teaching Council Bill seeks to provide for the establishment of a governing body for the teaching profession. The council will have legal powers to immediately suspend and cancel the registration of a teacher who has been charged with a disqualifiable offence, including sexual offences, murder, pornography, robbery and fraud. The bill will also institute a regime for the licensing and registration of all government-paid teachers. With the support of the government, a private company has been set up to service transformers used by power supply entities such as the Jamaica Public Service Company. Federal Transformer Manufacturing and Consulting Limited was recently launched at the former Jamaica Bauxite Mines plant in St. Anne. The company got technical and financial support from government through Jampro and the Exim Bank. Industry Minister Anthony Hilton says the company's introduction to the market could result in significant reduction in the cost of electricity, as light and power companies would no longer need to send their transformers to other countries for servicing. It is operations like FTMC that offer many opportunities for engineering workforce to upgrade itself and to broaden the scope of its training and development. I therefore want to go on record to inform the directors of Federal Transformer Manufacturing and Consulting Limited that now that you have opened shop in Jamaica, the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce and its agency and other supporting agents in government will continue to help you to make the most of your investment. Federal Transformer Manufacturing and Consulting Limited represents an investment of 400,000 US dollars in startup capital. The company employs 23 people and expects to increase that number to more than 200 within three years. And finally, the industry ministry has launched its Logistics 102 course as part of government's push to develop Jamaica as a logistics-centered economy. 20 people were trained at the recent inaugural Logistics 102 session, which aimed to teach aspects of global supply chain management. This is the initiative of the government to bring training to the people. And this when people can understand and is a collaboration of different agencies across government. Logistics 102 is the advanced level to Logistics 101, which trained more than 36,000 people. Those certified under Logistics 101 and who want to complete Logistics 102 should contact the Ministry for further information. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Stacey Ann Smith. Thank you for watching. Productivity, pathway to prosperity. A message brought to you by the Jamaica Productivity Center, a department of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. The wheels that I sit on are typical of the wagons that were used in the 1800s by the wealthy. So you can see from this that our national hero was a successful man. But despite his wealth, his cause was to stand up for the poor and the marginalized, which at that time would have been the poor black ex-slaves in a colonial era. So, who was our national hero? Here's my last hint. He was of mixed race, he had a white father and a black mother. Now learn more about him in this upcoming feature. In the early 1800s, the wealthy Scottish planter Joseph Gordon owned a large sugar estate in the parish of St. Andrew and lived in a beautiful Georgian great house on its grounds. In 1820, Joseph Gordon fathered a son with a slave woman. He was named George William Gordon. George William was not born a slave, although he was born before emancipation. He spent most of his childhood in the house set up by his father for his children born of this slave woman. From an early age, George William's father noticed his keen interest in books and encouraged him to study. 
The young Gordon was also a great orator and took part in religious debates at an early age. Gordon's commitment to religion never waned. He started an independent Baptist organization and erected a tabernacle in Kingston where he often preached. Gordon helped his followers to open chapels in many parts of the island and also ordained several deacons, including Paul Bogle of Stony Gut. In later years, this educated gentleman became a successful businessman. He concentrated on buying and leasing lands, which he cut up and sold or sublet cheaply to the Negro peasants, who at the time had great difficulty obtaining land. He also sold them livestock and organized a marketing system through which they could sell their produce at fair prices. Emancipation was not a welcome change for most of the planter class in Jamaica, and many tried by various means to hinder the progress of blacks. Gordon was a member of the wealthy middle class who did his best to help the free slaves. When he entered politics, he used this medium to speak out frequently about the unjust treatment of this group. By 1865, the social and economic crisis in Jamaica had reached a dangerous level. The harshness and insensitivity of the then governor, Edward Eyre, did nothing to relieve the tension. Gordon was outraged by the conditions he saw. Although he wanted to see a change in the social and material conditions of the blacks, he never advocated violence as a means of achieving this change. As a member of the Jamaican Assembly, he spoke out on behalf of the poor Negroes and bitterly criticized Governor Eyre. It was therefore ironic that he was blamed for instigating and supporting the Morant Bay Rebellion in St. Thomas. Despite the lack of evidence, Governor Eyre issued a warrant for his arrest. On hearing this, George William Gordon gave himself up to the authorities and was quickly taken to Morant Bay where he was illegally tried and sentenced to death. Gordon was hanged with 18 other persons on October 23, 1865. The residential area, now known as Cherry Gardens, is the former estate where George William Gordon was born. As you just heard in that last feature, George William Gordon was born right here in Cherry Gardens. The home was passed on to him by his father, a Scottish planter, Joseph Gordon, and he, George William Gordon, expanded the property. It has been owned for the past 40 years by businessman Oliver Jones. I'm now going to talk to the caretaker, Mr. Henry, who's going to tell us a little bit more, some interesting information. Mr. Henry, hey. Nice to meet Good you. Good to see you. Nice, nice, nice. Yes. Tell me something now. Tell me something interesting about this property that our viewers would love to hear. Yeah, what, what I know about this, uh, understand about this property, it, 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 it used to be at this, what told me you can understand, before they cut it up. And, the, and um, the, before Mr. Jones acquired it, it was used to be owned by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Dewey. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and then, after Mr. Jones have it now, he went for almost 40 years, as you was said previously. So, and then we, we have a lot of things which features here, like, as you, as you will see as you go along. Mm -hmm. Mango, breadfruit, ackee, cherries, and tangerine. And so forth and so forth and so forth. You understand? Very interesting. Thank you. Let's go and take a look yeah. around the property. This is on his uh, East Indian, Nelson. Um, is that, is that in graphic mango? Oh, okay. That one over there is a jewelry. Yes, I recognize the jewelry. Bambia, uh, Robin, and the Aki and the breadfruit, and the uh, Agapa. Oh, yeah, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the tour, Henry. Thank you. Yes, no, Guys, no, 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 no. talk about Jamaican favorites. I mean, as Henry was telling me, they have everything here. Mango, breadfruit, pear, Aki, coconut. Yeah. Makes me long for my Jamaican dishes. Speaking of which, have you ever wondered how these foods became a part of our local cuisine? Watch this next feature to find out just how. It's a melting pot of cultures, 
cooking techniques, ingredients, flavors, and spices from all who've had a hand in the making of the nation. Taino, Spanish, British, African, Chinese, Indian, and others, shaping a national culinary palate that's more than 50 years in the making. Jamaica's cuisine has come a far way. The island now boasts dozens of fast food chains, oriental restaurants, all natural eateries and indigenous food shops that serve a buffet of dishes, many of which were not celebrated fair just 50 years ago when Jamaica was a newly independent nation. Credit must go to government bodies like the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, which has been promoting the consumption of authentic Jamaican foods since its culinary competition in hotels was introduced in 1965. Do you like roast yam? <laughs> You're not alone. Many Jamaicans have acquired a taste for this particular dish, and they didn't have to look far for its creation. Roasting is a centuries-old cooking style that Jamaicans owe to the Taino peoples that once occupied this land. Just 50 years ago, it was still a time-consuming, more labor-intensive practice of roasting ground provisions and meats in the earth. They even roast the fish in the earth and then they scrape it off. Now, Jamaicans from all walks of life are roasting over grills, on meat sheets, in less time, but with as much flavor as their ancestors. Since the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the 15th century, Spanish flavors have been spicing up Jamaican pots on a regular basis. One particular cooking style and its most popular creation has made a big impression. We, in Spain, we fry a lot. There is definitely the one dish that uh, has a clear uh, connection with Spain, which is the uh, escovitch. Empanada to the Spanish, patty to Jamaicans. Since the late 1970s to early 1980s, this meat-filled dough dish has been another favorite. The concept is very much the same. The difference would be, and there there is again a mixture of other cultures, in this regard, I guess, the British and the Indians, the filling. As the local cattle industry beefed up its output in the 1960s, Jamaicans wholeheartedly reclaimed one of their favorite pre-independence imports. Now on a Saturday, there is hardly a household that is not cooking either the popular beef soup or one of its other variations. The British like to boil, and it's from them that we've adopted this cooking method to serve up a wide array of dishes that are uniquely Jamaican. Hot as it is, Jamaicans love their teas. And while traditional English flavors were the popular choices for about the first two decades of independence, industrious Jamaicans have more recently been bagging indigenous and African-inspired flavors. It could have been the love for teas by the English that prompted then-governor Sir Nicholas Laws to plant coffee seedlings in the island back in the 1700s. From the first plant in Temple Hall, St. Andrew, the Blue Mountain Coffee is now a global brand. With about 90% of the Jamaican population claiming African heritage, it's easy to see why the continent gets credit for most of what we eat. But there was a time when claiming that particular heritage was not for popular consumption. You wouldn't find Bami being sold in the supermarket in the 60s or late 70s. Green bananas were a no-no if you're sort of, you know, it was a very peasant thing and you couldn't say that you're eating green bananas. No more. Today, Jamaicans of all ethnicities delight in their prickled or corn meats, mackerel rondong, and yes, the many faces of bami and banana, green, ripe, boiled, fried, however you want it. What would the Jamaican diet look like without the maroons? They would catch the wild hog. They would prepare that wild hog and they would dig a hole and they put the fire in the earth, in the hole, and they would set up a wooden grill over that hole and anchor these um, sticks with, with stones and so on. And then they would have the pig um, on that pimento, green pimento wood that is anchored over that hole. And that was how they would roast the pig. 
after they season it, of course, with bird pepper and pepper elder. And from the hole emerged the most popular maroon gift to the dinner plate, jerk. In the 1980s, you could only get jerk pork in Portland. Only at um, the Port Antonio market on a Saturday when the, the maroons used to go there to, um, to sell it. And then afterwards, I think one of the maroons was started the stand at Boston. Giving us the widely popular Boston jerk pork and its many challenges from all across the island. The truth is over the last 50 years, we have had a major integration of, of Indian culinary arts into Jamaican art. The most popular integration is not a specific dish, it's a spice. While Jamaicans tend to rub it on the meat and the Indians are more likely to put it in hot oil, everyone agrees curry is a much appreciated import from the Asian continent. You know, in Jamaica we are very adventurous. We like to go beyond what we are accustomed to. So we move from curry go to curry chicken and all sorts of things are being curried too. The Jamaicans have come to embrace the Chinese cuisine because it, it's good. Well, you know Jamaicans, sometimes we cook the Chinese thing at home with the soy sauce, but we have to throw a little jerk seasoning in it and what have you, because it's a combination of flavors. But when Rasta say Ital food and no deaders and no flesh and face and bone and People used to look at it in scan and say, bridge that go blow your way, and you know, up to now, no bridge that blow your way. You see, if you have the proper combination of seasoning in your pot and, and the proper timing, you don't need to use the salt and the other little artificial things. Many Jamaicans still cook with salt, and meats remain a constant. But the healthy lifestyle pushed decades ago by the Rastafarian community is now a well accepted and celebrated way to live. No Jamaican cookbook could be complete without this chapter. Whether it stems from a fruit or it's brewed in a lab, Jamaicans love to imbibe. So ginger beer, to lemonade, and then we have sorrel. And we have been making a lot of drinks with, with our fruits, like um, sour sap punch, and um, we make breadfruit punch, and sorrel, and at Christmas time there's egg punch. Now that is the perfect cap on a multi-ethnic menu, fit for the most iry people in the world. Yes, it's emancipation and independence time again. Between July 31 to August 6, lots of fun and exciting island-wide celebrations await you. Independence concerts, community church services, festival bad wagons, street dances, and lots more. And guess what? Festival fashion is back. The theme, bandana with denim, catch the fashion rhythm. So for this festival season, young, old, boy, girl, get your bandana and denim outfits and let's celebrate Jamaica in style. For more information, call JCDC at 926-5726-9 or email library at jcdc.gov.jm. Independence 2015, proud and free Jamaica 53. Since we get free pops, time is the world. This is definitely a blast from the past. Back when the Cherry Gardens property was a sugar estate, this structure behind me was a slave's quarters. Gordon's father acquired the property and later became involved with a mulatto slave woman, Anne Ratchery, Gordon's mother. Today, mixed couples are no big deal, but back then, I'm sure it raised more than a few eyebrows. 
It's safe to say that emancipation has changed the face and fabric of Jamaican society. But what does emancipation mean to you? It's very important because it helps us to remember the days of slavery and to remember our culture. And the most important part is to help um, remember when the slaves were freed. Jamaica's emancipation is very important to me and when I hear the word emancipation, freedom comes to mind and it shows us that we were free from the English. Jamaica's emancipation is important to me um, because we can live as free people and we don't have to live under the rule of someone else. Well, it's very important to me because it marks the year that um, freedom, we were free from slavery. And it, so like, if it was still going on today, like, I have no idea how I would live because all the evil that was going on, all I read and all I heard, I, could, I couldn't manage it. So I'm glad that Jamaica got the opportunity to be free from such an evil time that they were going through. Jamaica's emancipation is very important to us because it gives us a unique culture and our own identity. Free from mental slavery and physical, and that only elevate us to push ourselves more. Well, I think for me personally, it shows that we're a free nation, so we have our own currency, our own flag, our own everything, so we can make our own decisions because we're that awesome, so yeah. Come catch the Independence 2015 fever and join in the competitions. There is the best decorated office and window competition for business and office owners. Best decorated town competition for parish councils. Best spirit of independence competition for media houses. And best diaspora celebrations for the Jamaican massive living abroad. So what are you waiting for? Make we celebrate. To enter, simply submit six photographs of your project by July 31 to jcdc.festival2015 at gmail.com. The competitions run from July 15 to August 15. For more information, call JCDC at 926-572629 or email library at jcdc.gov.jm. Independence 2015, proud and free Jamaica 53. A 53 since we get free I hope you learned something new about George William Gordon today. So the next time you use a $10 coin, remember that he fought and died so that we can have a just society where all Jamaicans are treated equally. This has been Jamaica Magazine. We'll be coming to you tomorrow from Nanny Town in the beautiful parish of Portland. Until then, walk good. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.